Here, let's talk about Blue Da Vinci. So you know when they throw in this term safety valve around, that means the judge can depart from what the sentencing guidelines is. And there's, I don't know, four or five criteria, first-time offender, nonviolent, Blue Da Vinci qualified for all those. And then the last qualifying element of the safety valve is if you have any helpful information about the case, you have to give it. But it specifically says in there, if you don't have any information, if the case, say, is already like over and everyone's taking a plea, which was what was going on with Blue, then you don't have to give any information to get the safety valve. But I'll let Blue tell his own story. How this whole thing about Blue Da Vinci and a rat even come together in the same sentence? <laughs> All right. It came from Big Meech. That's why it's implanted into people like that. That's why it's out there like that. That's why people is damn near positive that I told in reference to that limousine, the black limousine, and the same limousine that this nigga Salsa is put, he put somebody's paperwork in his book. He put my picture next to the paperwork and he told a story about how I, Blue Da Vinci, told about this limo and all of this other when in actuality, the paperwork was Ralph Sims' paperwork. And he put my picture next to another nigga's paperwork. That was just, that came later. What came first, the reason why he did that is because Big Meech put the word on the streets when the limousine first got picked up that I told on it, okay? And that's without receiving paperwork on who actually told on the limo. So what happened was this, it was a situation like this. You had a house, okay? And in this house, uh, there were certain people that were known affiliates that would, you know, do things at this certain house. The first people, whoever told first to get the in, to take the information to the jury to get the indictments initially, those people didn't have enough information to get me indicted. Either that or they was just saying, because I never saw those statements, okay? I never saw the initial statements that got all of the first round of people locked up in 05, October. All right. So when they did backdate and they put some statements up that got me indicted was a year and some change later. It was a year later and I went on a run and I got picked up even later than that. So naturally, I was told on. I was told on. That's how I got picked up. If not, then I would have been I would have been told on anyway and got picked up in the first indictment with Meech them. But I didn't they didn't have enough information to indict me or when, when they took the information to the grand jury at the beginning. So is it safe to say it's highly likely somebody in those, it was 30 people in Detroit, of which we know quite a few gave information. Some I, know, of them, I, got the statements, I got the statements on who told on me. I don't have to guess and say it's highly likely. Oh. I know exactly who told on me and gave the statements from Detroit. All right. Ooh, but I'm not here to even, I'm not here to talk about that right now. The people in Detroit know those people. See, I'm not here to make Detroit look bad because Detroit is a great city with some great niggas and some beautiful hustlers there. So I'm not there to throw smut on Detroit. I'm just here to bring awareness to the situation since niggas got it out there all crazy and with the wrong information out there. I'm just here to clear up the information that's here. Not to add information on people and all that shit. I let the boys in the D take care of their people in the D. Now, if it was some niggas from where I'm from that we had that issue with, then I would be instrumental in, in, in fucking with that. So that's the issue to deal with all them niggas that told on us that's from the D. Now, because it wasn't only people from the D that told. In, in every city, there was informants. Right. Okay, so now- well, Not informants, but cooperating co Cooperators that, well, you know, they yeah. did what they had to do to whatever tried to do what they had to do to, to get where they were trying to go. Now, go ahead. So the allegation against you of snitching was only for the money, and that wasn't even you. That was Ralph Sims, and it. But, but it the was thing all was this: it, this was the thing about it. Fuck the allegation. It's the boss on the phone. See, the boss would be on the phone. I'm gonna use Jay Diggs for instance. The nigga Jay Diggs. I hate to even say his name and give his little crusty ass any kind of fucking light or shine because he's a fucking shine thirst motherfucker. But what he did, it, it was some whole shit because we were supposed to be friends, number one. 
But what he did was the truth. And I'm torn between it because I live by a model where the truth can never be considered as disrespect. But it can be considered in disres as disrespect pending the way that the person releases the information, okay? So now the truth of the matter is Jay Diggs was on the phone with Big Meech at a certain point in time and Big Meech was saying, man, I can't believe this nigga blew and told about this limo, Jay man. Jay Diggs is the, he's the Oakland rapper? From the Bay, from the Bay, okay. yeah. Big Meech tell Jay Diggs, man, I, I love the nigga Blue, man, but the nigga a rat, man. I can't believe this nigga told on his limo and blah, blah, blah. He had this conversation on the phone with Jay Diggs, and Jay Diggs latter did a song, and he basically reenacted that in a rap and said what Meech said. So basically, he tried to say he wasn't saying I was a snitch, but he was just saying what Big Meech, the boss, had said on the phone to him in a record. And I love the nigga Blue, but the nigga a rat. He rapped like Kumo D, some old school ass fucking Kumo D ass nigga rapping. And that's what the line was that I heard in the song, right? But then when we pushed the line, his word back was, man, blew my man. I don't even know why blew mad at me. And I did that just what Meech said. But how he played that shit was some whole shit. He didn't uh, get with me and try to figure it out. He came to see me one time when I had my restaurant in Atlanta. But he just was on some sucker shit. See, all that shit is for clout. See, that's for clout. So I don't like to really respond to that, feed into that shit, because I give them what they looking for in that. You know what I'm saying? So when I live in my truth, bro, I'm 45 years old, bro. I live in my truth. So I don't give a fuck for real what people say or how they feel because I live in the truth. You only care when you live in a lie or you live in it and you, you feel funny about it. Nigga, I go to sleep and wake up just fine every day in my situation. It was Meech that put that word there that made the masses of people start saying it initially in 2008. And was, was he just, he was just confused or? It was like this. Okay. All right. It was a certain, it was like, I'm going to just use a number. Say it was nine people that would frequent a house that would go, shit would go on that. So you like know these nine people, right? The house get hit, all right? It get, it get hit by the feds, all right? Later on, a year later or something, everybody go to jail. When people go to jail, this house and the limo and shit, the information about the limo that was at the house that never got picked up when the house got raided, Nobody ever said nothing out of Meech and all of the people that was there that knew, okay? Now, here I come a year later. I come get picked up a year later now. Nobody said nothing about this limo. So everybody that's in there is feeling like, nigga, if I get out first, that's my million dollars and my nine guns. I'm going to get it. I'm going to have it. That's probably how all of us felt that knew about the limo. Because that's how I felt, nigga. I even had the fucking serial numbers on the motherfucker. So I could track the car down and actually go buy it and get that motherfucker. And I know how to open it up and get the money out. You feel me? So that's how I know all of us was feeling without even talking to the guys about it, right? So I'm in jail, bro, in Atlanta already. I'm already in jail. I'm going to go to my sentence. And I didn't sign my plea agreement and everything. I didn't, I'm, I'm ready to go get my time. And then I look up on the news one day in the day room and they didn't found the limo. And I'm like, what the fuck? So, like, that night, I'm a lot more phone calls with niggas. That night, niggas is like, boy, niggas is saying you told about this limo. And I'm like, nigga, what? What the fuck? Hold on, I'm calling niggas. Niggas like, yeah, man, niggas is saying everybody came through. Didn't say nothing. I hear you come. You finna go to sentencing on Friday, and now the limo come out. Niggas is saying you told. Niggas try to put one and two together and just say I told because they figured Blue is the last nigga that really know about this house. That now he come through and they find out about the limo. So instead of doing some gangster shit, the real, see, when you a mob, fuck, fuck that. When you were in the street life, bro, you supposed to operate a certain way when it comes to street shit. Especially information about snitches and information that has been given to the government. You cannot mark a person with information that has been given to the government without the paperwork to back to facilitate that. You understand what I'm saying? You can't just say, well, shit, this nigga, man, hold on. All of us was already locked up. The only other nigga that was around there was blue. To be blue. That don't work, my nigga. You can't consider yourself a boss and move like that and make decisions like that. How you gonna be a mob boss and you condemn one of your best friends and your little homie of being a rat, my nigga? And you ain't seen no paperwork. When's the last time you spoke on the phone with me? Like 2017. Oh, 17. 
we've spoken all the way. He apologized for that. Once he got the paperwork and figured it out, if you if people go look up the Source magazine, oh, so it's other people now just repeating what he already. I, I always like to say it like this. Watch this, gang. I always like to say it like this. Remember when you was a kid in the class and you do that one test. And you say something to the person in their ear on this side, and yeah, you gotta keep telling around. The That's what happened with me and this shit. So it turned into I told on Big Meech, I put everybody in print. I didn't had niggas come on my pain. We gonna kill you because you told on Big Meech and the whole BMF. They turned me into William Marshall and to BI. That from that one thing that Meech said turned me in for years, bro. I've been fucking labeled as a snitch, bro, or a, a, just the, the not the inside people that really know or the people that knew me or the people that know, just by the people that's latching on and finding out what's going on. Oh, BMF is what? And oh, Big Meech is who? And Blue Da Vinci snitched? That is like a part of it. Like, I, like it really happened because it was coming from Meech, bro. So ain't nobody questioning that. And it just spread and spread and spread until the paperwork is just now coming out, niggas, who... For the public to understand that that was Ralph Sims' paperwork and not mine, so people could finally stop saying, man, Blue ain't told on that limo. But they try to bounce to something else now. It ain't the limo no more that we're dealing with. We're talking about it's something vague, else now. Yeah. Now uh, it's just that I went to a debriefing. It was not, not that I even told. It's that, that I did a, a debriefing. But what niggas don't understand is this was my first offense. Number one, I never knew what a debriefing was, nigga. I heard debriefing the word before, but it always had to do with a military. Never a jail. I never been locked up, nigga. I don't know. Once I got arrested by the U.S. Marshal Fugitive Task Force, bro, and Heron come, they grabbed me by my neck and by my shoulder, and they pushed me and pulled me anywhere they wanted to go. I never went into a room with the police on my own recognizance. I've never said, oh, I want to go to a meeting, or I want to try to, never, ever, anywhere. Only place I ever went on my own was through my attorney, and that was my plea agreement meeting. That is where the debriefing happened. There was no, oh, not no plea on the table. Now they just going to debrief me and find out what went on before everything. No, 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 no. That debriefing came in with my plea agreement meeting with the feds to see if once, because they gave me everything, I was, they put everything on the table that I asked for. The safety valve I asked for, the lower third of the sentencing guide to sign to the lower third we asked for, and shit like that. And they gave it to us. So now we had to go to the meeting. And now when we go to the meeting, that's what the debriefing was. I didn't know that it was called a scheduled meeting with my attorney present and me present and them showing me all of the statements that these niggas had against me. To me, that's what the meeting was. Okay. Now, if you want to call this a debriefing, they debriefing was showing me all of the statements that these niggas had made against me. That's how I know who everybody had told on me before I even went to jail. Before I even had my own discovery pack paperwork, when I went with these people, they laid out all the 14 statements that was against me. I had 14 statements against me, bro. That's what my deal was. 14 different people? Yes, 14, 14 different, different people, it, different it, statements. It, and according, I only know what I read in the book about you. Like, so you basically pled guilty to unloading, yeah. unloading cocaine. Yeah. All right. So, what, so initially, right? That's what it was and how I got my time. This is uh, explain a lot. Initially, all right, I signed my plea agreement for 109 months. The judge agreed to come out of the mandatory mi mandatory minimum of 10 years because of the, I was awarded that, and it was back up to the judge's discretion at that time. I don't know how it is now if they got the discretion again where they can look at your criminal history, your background, and look at your positive accomplishments, look at you in court, hear the case, and make their own decision whether they want to come out of a mandatory minimum or whatever. They could depart from the sentencing guidelines. So now, when you take Blue Da Vinci and put him as the defendant, what you got at that time was a half a paragraph on a piece of paper, which was my rap sheet, which was this case. It was the charges from this case. I had no prior, okay? Now, my positive accomplishments that sat in front of the judge were this tall, and she couldn't see past them. She had to look over them and around them to talk when they were in front of her. I'm talking about I got movie scripts from the roles that I've done, Paramount Pictures, Trimark Pictures. I've got record deals, Koch records. I've got all of the, uh, you know, things from community people and fucking toy drives I done did and all of the great things I done did. I did the church and all of this shit they didn't turn in from the school and principals, all this shit that we do to get the people to turn in a positive information. The shit was this tall on her desk, bro. People have to understand that this is a judge we was dealing with. I didn't go to trial. I didn't have a jury to decide my fate. I had one person 
to make a decision on my sentencing. And it was up to her discretion to do it how she wanted to do it. So to not make a long conversation about it, how she felt about Blue Da Vinci was, I don't see how you got caught up with these people. You had a fucking great career that you was already in, not ahead of you. You were already in the career. And she was like, bro, how did you do this? And my whole thing was like, look, I didn't sign up to this shit to be, a, I signed up for this shit to do music. It was stomping ground entertainment. That's the fuck what it was, all that extra shit, extra shit. Period. So if I got to go to jail, I got to go to jail. But I'm going to jail knowing that I was doing motherfucking music with these niggas, blah, 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 blah. If the shit went the way that it was supposed to go, we, none of us would have went to prison. If everybody could understand that, maybe people think I'm crazy for saying that. But I will get to that later and I'll show you actually how we wouldn't have went to prison if the shit would have went how I envisioned it and planned for it to go. All right. So go ahead. We can so they didn't even say... There was no pleading guilty to you really distributing drugs, just kind of helping unload and, and move it around. Okay, so look, I pled, no, I pled guilty for the distribution of 150 more. Is that what you I were pled supposedly guilty personally to. sold or that you unloaded? It, it, it don't matter. Oh, I was just, just responsible for them. So, so yeah, see, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, <laughs> bro, when you deal with whether I took them out of the car and counted them, whether I stacked them up, whether I waited till people come and pick them up or whatever. So at the beginning, you had a William Marshall nigga told these people that he seen me receive 80 to 100 kilos on at least six to seven occasions. One instance he could remember for certain was 4th of July, 2003, where I had a party at my house, a 4th of July party at my house. And after the party, when everybody had left, all the party goers left, a white limo came to my house and I unloaded it and he helped me unload it.